I train to be a social psychologist in the field of child development and personality theory. I got my PhD from Stanford and I was a professor at Harvard. I taught at Cal and Stanford and Harvard. I came from a middle class, upwardly mobile family, and I got my PhD primarily out of fear. And when I got to Harvard, I assumed that now that I was in one of the inner temples, I would know. Down the hall from me in one direction was Eric Erickson, another was Dave Reisman, Jerry Bruner of cognitive psychology, some of the people who were social scientists who supposedly knew. But it stood to reason that if we all knew, we should really be grooving. And we weren't. Life just wasn't beautiful enough. Everybody was talking about the rat race, looking drawn out in a highly competitive field. And what bothered me was I knew I didn't know. But if you look in other people's eyes to get the image of who you are, it's pretty good. And everybody kept saying, well, he's a Harvard professor, so he knows. And my mother was proud of me. And I had collected all of the symbols of success in society, or at least a large number of them. I had a Cessna airplane, and a Mercedes Benz, and a Triumph motorcycle, and I went skin diving in Nassau, and you know, and I sat on important committees. But every now and then, just before I'd be going to sleep, or when I'd be in the bathtub or something, that'd be that moment when there wasn't somebody else's eyes to look into to tell me how wonderful I was. And I knew that it wasn't enough. And I thought, well, I have 40 more years of this. And I think it is most likely that I would have gone along at that pace, just collecting more and more badges. But down the hall from me, I was a big empire builder. I had 40 research assistants and um, two secretaries in four offices at Harvard, and I was in four different departments. And um, down the hall from me, in a little closet-like room that didn't have any secretaries and nothing going, sat a man, and we became drinking buddies, and his name was Timothy Leary. And one evening, we talked about Mexico, and he said he was going to be in Mexico the next summer, and invited me to visit with him, and in a drunken moment, I said, well, why don't we fly across the north of South America, because I'm a pilot. And he said, that's a great idea. So we made a plan, and I neglected to tell him that all I had was my student license. <laughs> but I worked hard all spring, and I got my license the day before I left for Mexico. And it was a hair-raising trip, and I arrived at the Cuernavaca, where Timothy was, and he had just ingested these mushrooms which are called Tiananoctal, or Flesh of the Gods. And he said he had seen more in nine hours than he had learned in all his years as a psychologist. And there weren't any more mushrooms around. <laughs> so we didn't go to South America. We hung out and talked about the mushroom. And then we went back to the United States, and I was away. I was teaching at Cal as a visiting professor. And when I got back in the spring, one night on the night of a large snowstorm, I was invited over to Timothy's house. I was visiting my parents in this suburb near Timothy, about a few blocks away. And I walked a few blocks to uh, ingest psilocybin, the synthetic of the Mexican mushrooms. And then I went off into the living room by myself. And this is the report of that uh, few moments at that point. But now, a few hours later, I had gone off by myself to reflect upon these new feelings and senses. A deep calm pervaded my being. The rug crawled and the pictures smiled, all of which delighted me. Then I saw a figure standing about eight feet away where a moment before there had been no one. I peered into the semi-darkness and recognized none other than myself, in cap and gown and hood as a professor. It was as if that part of me, which was Harvard professor, had separated or dissociated itself from me. Well, I thought, I worked hard to get that status, but I don't really need it. So it's over there and I'm over here, so I'll give it up. I won't get frightened. Okay. 
Again, I settled back into the cushions, but at that moment, the figure changed. Again, I looked, leaned forward, straining to see. Ah, me again. But now it was that aspect of me which was the social cosmopolite. Okay, so that goes too, I thought. Again and again, the figure changed, and I recognized over there all the different aspects I knew to be me. Cellist, pilot, etc. With each new presentation, I again and again reassured myself that I didn't need that anyway. Then I saw the figure over there become that in me which was Richard Alpert-ness. That is, the basic social identity by which I had always acknowledged my existence. Sweat broke out on my forehead. I wasn't at all sure I could do without being Richard Alpert. Did that mean I'd have amnesia? Was that what this drug that this madman had given me was going to do? Would it be permanent? Should I call Tim? What the hell? I'll give up being Richard Alpert. I can always get a new social identity. At least I have my body. But I spoke too soon. As I looked down at my body for reassurance, I could see nothing below the kneecaps. And slowly, now to my horror, with my eyes wide open, I saw the progressive disappearance of limbs and then torso, until all there was was the couch on which I had sat. This is usually known as a bad trip report. <laughs> a scream formed in my throat. I felt that I was dying since there was nothing in my universe that led me to believe in life after leaving the body. Doing without professorness or loverness or even Richard Alpertness was okay, but I certainly needed the body. Panic mounted, adrenaline shot through my system, my mouth became dry, but along with this, a voice sounded inside, what I don't know, but inside, an intimate voice asked very quietly and rather jocularly, it seemed to me, considering how distraught I was, but who's minding the store? When I could finally focus on the question, which takes a while, I realized that though everything by which I knew myself, even my body and thus life itself as I knew it was, was gone, still I was fully aware. Not only that, but this aware I was watching the entire drama, including the panic, with calm compassion. Instantly, with this recognition, I felt a new kind of calmness, one of a profundity never experienced before. I had just found that I, later I called it a scanning device, a point, an essence, place where I existed independent of social and physical identity. That which was I was beyond life and death. And something else, that I knew. It really knew. It was wise rather than just knowledgeable. It was the voice inside that spoke truth. I recognized it, was one with it, and felt as if my entire life of looking to the outside world for reassurance was over. Now I need only look within to that place where I knew. Fear turned into exaltation. I ran out into the snow laughing. In a moment the house was lost from view, but it was all right because inside I knew. At about 5.30 I walked through the silent land a few blocks my heart full to overflowing with the joy of my newfound self. At my parents' home, I felt the urge to clear the walk, as any good young tribal buck might. Happily, I set about the task. Then the upstairs window flew open, and there were my parents. Come to bed, you idiot. <laughs> Nobody shovels snow in the middle of the night. Ah, there was that external voice to which I had always listened. But what did the voice inside say? It said, it's okay to shovel snow, and it's okay to be happy. 
I laughed up at them, danced a bit of a jig, and returned to shoveling. When I looked again, they had closed the window, and behind it, they too were smiling. It's known as a contact high. 